Greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the John Campia Show here on my YouTube channel. I'm, of course, your host, John Campia, and it is an honor and a privilege, as it is every day, to have you guys joining me here as we talk about all of our favorite things in the world, movies and some television shows and stuff like that. And, of course, today a whole bunch of stuff to talk about. But here's how today's show is going to go. Number one, we're going to talk about the Oscar nominations, obviously. And then I'm going to take a couple questions and topics that you guys have emailed into me. How do you email in a topic or question to be on the John Campia Show? It's simple. You just email me anytime at john at the John And make sure you put the word topic in the subject line. And then after we get through those, I'll have a little bit of time to take a few live questions that you guys have in there. Going to let you guys know, too, yesterday we did our first episode of Open Mic. And that's, of course, at 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Monday through Friday. And it was a lot of fun. We had a really good time taking your audio and video questions you guys sent in, as well as all the live questions. I had a great time doing it. Looking forward to doing tonight's show as well. Don't forget, it's Tuesday, the best day of the week, which means Star Wars Talk Tuesday is also today. That's going to be at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. That's 4 p.m. East Coast Time. So it's a busy day around here today. So <laughs> with all that out of the way, let's dive into the first topic. And the first topic, of course, today is the 2018 Academy Award nomination list got announced. Uh, the nominees are now out there. Who got snubbed? Were there any big surprises? Did Patrick Stewart get his Academy Award nomination? And well, let's run down through the major ones here first. And then we'll talk a little bit about what maybe was snubbed, what maybe wasn't snubbed, all that kind of stuff. So let's jump in here. <clears throat> We're going to start off here with visual effects. Blade Runner 2049, Guardians of the Galaxy 2, Kong Skull Island, Star Wars The Last Jedi, and War for the Planet of the Apes. I'll be honest with you here. As good as Blade Runner looked, I probably I don't have a problem with Blade Runner being nominated in this, but I probably either would have moved it out or Kong Skull Island, and the visual effects in both of those movies were great. And I probably would have made room for Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets. Now, obviously Blade Runner 2049 is a better movie, but this isn't which is the better movie. This is the best visual effects. I probably would have made room for Valerian. But, uh, but overall, these are all solid films. I have a feeling War for the Planet of the Apes might take best visual effects. Okay, let's go on to the next category here. Sound mixing. Same five films, this doesn't always happen, but it did happen this year. Same five films nominated for sound mixing and for sound editing, and that is Baby Driver, Blade Runner 2049, Dunkirk, The Shape of Water, and The Last Jedi. Um, <coughs> so both of those, all of those films were also nominated between sound mixing and sound editing. And you know what, it's funny, Star Wars The Last Jedi got four Academy Award nominations, by the way. Um, score, visual effects, sound editing, and sound mixing. But anyway, so there are those. No big surprises to me. I was really happy to see Baby Driver got included in there because the sound design and the sound editing in, in that movie was actually quite remarkable. All right, so let's move on here. We move on to now production design. No surprises here across the board. Beauty and the Beast, wonderful production design. Blade Runner 2049, Darkest Hour, Dunkirk, the Shape of Water. You know what? This could be what I think this one is going to go to Beauty and the Beast. I do. I think the production design on that movie was just absolutely bonkers. Now, I think an argument can be made for all the movies in this category. I'm not going to be surprised if any of them win. Blade Runner 2049, I think, is strong here. But I'm going to give the edge to Beauty and the Beast for production design on this one. Okay, let's move on now to... Last year, the category that I believe went to Suicide Squad, and this year the nominees, all very, very deserving, Darkest Hour, Victoria and Abdul, <coughs> and Wonder. Uh, three deserving nominees. I'm going to go Victoria and Abdul on this one. I think that was a, not only is it a really great little film, but the uh, costuming and makeup, hair, all that kind of stuff were just fabulous in that movie, so I'm going to go with, uh, with that one. All right. We now, speaking of costume, we go on to costume design. Again, all very worthy nominees. We've got Beauty and the Beast, The Darkest Hour, Phantom Thread, Shape of Water, Victoria and Abdul. 
I'm going to go Victoria and Abdul again, actually. I'm going to take that one that with a close second going to Beauty and the Beast. So those are my picks there. But again, it's very tight. Who knows how that one's going to work out. All right. Let's get into some of the bigger awards here. We're going to start off now with film editing. And I was so pleasantly surprised to see Baby Driver nominated. I'll get to that in a second. Dunkirk. I, Tanya. I was a little surprised with I, Tanya, to be honest. I thought the editing was very good, but... I thought there might have been a couple other films that could have slipped in there, but I have no problem with it. We've got The Shape of Water and Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. Now, I don't think Baby Driver is going to win, but I mentioned this on my live reaction video earlier this morning when the nominees were announced. Baby Driver is brilliantly edited because a lot of films, when they try to give a feel of franticness and everything, they just do a lot of hat chop cutting, chop, 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 and it, but it doesn't really have a rhyme or reason. The Baby Driver editing was so perfect that it really elevated the film. And so I was really excited to see Baby Driver uh, get one of those nominations. I got a feeling this one might go to three billboards, as a matter of fact. That or Dunkirk. Dunkirk or three billboards, I think, are the ones that will probably win in this category. But let's wait and see. Okay, now we move on to Best Cinematography. And you know what? This is going to be a tighter race than I think a lot of people originally thought. Because when Blade Runner 2049 first came out, I think a lot of people thought, oh, this one's going to win Best Cinematography. It was gorgeous. But the cinematography in Dunkirk cannot be overlooked. It's amazing. Uh, Mudbound, Shape of Water, Darkest Hour. Uh, I think this is going to come down to between Blade Runner 2049 and Dunkirk. The editing so pivotal in both of those films. Or the cinematography, I mean, is so pivotal in both of those films. So I got a feeling it's going to come down to one of those things. All right. We get now into best original score. And in the best original score category, we've got Dunkirk, Phantom Thread, Shape of Water, John Williams gets another nomination with Star Wars The Last Jedi, and three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri. Man, I... I'm going to... Dunkirk or The Last Jedi. I, I just... The scores in both of them are so prevalent, but this one's going to be tight. I, I can't pick a winner per se, but that one's going to be tight. All right, we move on now to Best Original Song. Mighty River from Mudbound, Mystery of Love from Call Me By Your Name, Remember Me from Coco, Stand Up for Something from Marshall, and This Is Me from The Greatest Showman. I believe this one is probably hands gonna, down going to go to This Is Me from The Greatest Showman. There is an outside possibility, I think, for Coco. Uh, I think Coco will have an outside shot at that, but I, I think this award is going to go to This Is Me, and it's going to be well-deserved. All right, best documentary feature. We got Abacus, Small Enough to Jail, uh, Faces Places, Icarus, Last Man in Aleppo, and Strong Island. I've only seen three of these, um, so it's, it's difficult for me to really give any kind of a guess on that, but I want to know, what do you guys think might get it out of theirs? Uh, Best Foreign Language Film, I'm going to skip over it for time's sake just because I know most of you guys haven't seen most of the Best Foreign Language. I've only seen two of them myself. We get into Best Original Screenplay. I was thrilled and surprised that The Big Sick got nominated for Best Original Screenplay, and I couldn't be happier about it. I really thought they were going to overlook this film. I really did. It's not going to win, but I really thought they were going to overlook The Big Sick. And I really thought it deserved one of these nomination spots. I was so excited to see that The Big Sick did get one of the nomination spots for Best Original Screenplay. We also have Get Out, Lady Bird, in my opinion, the most overrated film of the year, but whatever. Uh, the Shape of Water and Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. I believe this one's going to go to Three Billboards Outside of Ebbing, Missouri, but, again, but it could go to Shape of Water. It's going to be a tight race. But again, I'm just really happy that The Big Sick got in there because I didn't think it would. All right, <clears throat> and here we go. Best Adapted Screenplay, and this is going to be the news for a lot of us in this community. First of all, Call Me By Your Name, The Disaster Artist, Molly's Game, Mudbound, and Logan. Logan pulled off nowhere near the number of Oscars it deserved to be nominated for, but as my number one film of the year, Really happy that Logan managed to snag not just one Academy Award nomination, but one of the majors. So, you know, you got Best Picture, Actor, Actress, uh, Supporting Actress, Supporting Actress, 
uh, uh, director and the screenplays. There's your majors. And it was really nice to see Logan get one of the major nominees, uh, nomination spots. It's not going to win. Uh, if I had to pick a winner out of this one, I think the winner for this one probably goes to Call Me By Your Name. Although, do not count out Mudbound. Don't count out Mudbound at all. And I adored Molly's Game. I love that. I, I would probably pick Molly's Game as the best screenplay, but it's not going to win. I think it's either going to be Call Me By Your Name or Mudbound. All right. Moving to Best Animated Feature. And this just, once again, goes to prove that there should not even be this category. Because in a year where you're so desperate for nominees, the are putting Ferdinand and Boss Baby in there. That just tells you you shouldn't even have this category. But whatever. The nominees <coughs> for Best Animated Feature, Boss Baby, The Breadwinner, Ferdinand, Loving Vincent, and obviously the winner of this one is going to be Coco. How the Lego Batman movie got left out of this, I've got to read into it to see if there was some kind of disqualifier if for some reason it didn't qualify, because how Ferdinand was not a terrible movie. No, but it is not an Oscar nomination film. How the boss baby, which is not a horrible, surprisingly is not a horrible film, but is not an Oscar nominated worthy film. How these movies got a spot over Batman, the Lego Batman movies come honestly completely beyond me. I'm almost as befuddled about that as the first time the Lego movie didn't get nominated for best animated feature. And it probably should have been the favorite to win Best Animated Feature. But uh, it, again, it just goes to show you that in years that you're... If you got to nominate films like Ferdinand and Boss Baby, this should not be a category. Count animated films amongst all films. Uh, but anyway, I'm not, I, I've gone on about that enough. All right, let's move on now to Best Directing. Dunkirk by Christopher Nolan. Jordan Peele for his work on Get Out. Greta Gerwig for her work on Lady Bird. Paul Thomas Anderson for Phantom Thread, and The Shape of Water for Guillermo del Toro. I got a feel this one's going to go, I believe, to either Guillermo del Toro or Christopher Nolan. I will say this. You guys, if you see my um, review for Get Out, you know I think Get Out's a really good movie. I was really happy with that movie. I came out extremely satisfied with Get Out. I do not think Jordan Peele des deserves a Best Director nomination. I think he did a great job. But to not nominate McDonough for three billboards outside of Ebbing, Missouri is laughable. To not nominate Steven Spielberg for The Post is laughable. To not nominate Denis Villeneuve for Blade Runner 2049 is laughable. Um, so I believe, I mean, look, I still, no matter what, the winner of this category is either going to be Christopher Nolan or Guillermo del Toro, Right. So, and both of those guys are nominated. So really, that's all that matters. They've got the two right guys in there, the two right directors, I should say. And one of those two is going to win. But it, it, it wasn't odd. I think this one was a little bit odd, but whatever. All right, we move on now to Best Actress in a Supporting Role. Big stacked category this year. Mary Date, Jay Blige from Mudbound. Allison Janney, who will win this award, I believe, for I, Tonya. Leslie Manville for Phantom Thread, which I was a little bit surprised by, to be honest with you. Laurie Metcalf for Lady Bird and Octavia. I love Octavia Spencer. I was very excited to see Octavia Spencer nominated for Best Actress for her work in The Shape of Water. All right. We move on now to Best Actor in the Supporting Role, which absolutely, beyond a shadow of a doubt, one of these spots should have been for Patrick Stewart. There is no question. But they didn't. I mean, I, I wasn't going to insist that Logan get nominated for Best Picture. I wasn't going to insist that Logan got nominated for Best Adapted Screenplay. But I was insistent. It, it's Patrick Stewart should have got nominated for Best Supporting Actor for Logan. I think it's one of the top three Best Supporting Performances of the year. But whatever, they did not give it to him. Who did they give the nods to? A very deserving Willem Dafoe for The F Florida Project. A very deserving Woody Harrelson for Three bur Billboards Outside uh, Ebbing, Missouri. A deserving Richard Jenkins for Shape of Water. Sam Rockwell, very deserving for three billboards, billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri. And Christopher Plummer. And look, <clears throat> I love Christopher Plummer. He did a really good job stepping in for all the money in the world. And Christopher Plummer is a good Canadian kid. So I'm biased towards Christopher Plummer. There is no way Christopher Plummer should have gotten this nomination spot ahead of either Army Hammer for Call Me By Your Name or Patrick Stewart for Logan. Just no way. 
Don't get me wrong, I'm always happy to see the good Canadian kids get Academy Award nominations, but th there is no way, there's no way that I, I think either Army Hammer or Patrick Stewart should have had that spot. So, but hey, it is what it is overall. I mean, just again, look at this. It's a Willem Dafoe, Woody Harrelson, Richard Jenkins, Sam Rockwell. Four out of the five are just undisputable. I mean, they're, they're there. You cannot complain about any of those four. They had the one, I think, a little missed up with Christopher Plummer, but hey, whatever. All right, now we get into the leading roles. <clears throat> we start off with Best Actress in a Leading Role. This one, again, is going to be tight, man. I think it comes down to Sally Hawkins for The Shape of Water and Fance, uh, Frances McDormand for Three Bill Billboards Outside Eggman, Missouri. Then you've got Margot Robbie, who was fantastic in I, Tonya, Saoirse Ronan for Lady Bird, and Meryl Streep for The Post. I have no complaints about any of these nominees. I think I think Meryl Streep... There are some people who are going to be tempted to say, oh, they only nominated Meryl Streep because you're supposed to nominate Meryl Streep. If you say that, you didn't see the post. Meryl Streep was f -f 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 phenomenal in that. Um, it's just that I think we've just come to expect perfection from Meryl Streep. So even when she gives us perfection, we kind of go, oh, oh, whatever, it's just another Meryl Streep performance. Her performance in the post was insanely good. She totally deserves this nomination. However, I think this year it is going to come down between Sally Hawkins for The Shape of Water and Frances McDormand. I'm going to lean towards Frances McDormand. Um, I just think one of the best performances she's ever given. So I'm going to lean that way. Okay, let's move over to Best Actor in a Leading Role. <coughs> yeah, it would have been nice to see... Uh, Hugh Jackman in here, but let's not kid ourselves. We're not surprised. Timothy Shamalot from Call Me By Your Name, Daniel Day-Lewis for Phantom Thread, Daniel Kuluya from Get Out, Gary Oldman from Darkest Hour, Denzel Washington from Roman J. Israel Esquire. Now, there are a few... Let, let's put this way. The one big name that's missing from here is James Franco. I'm going to tell you what I've been telling a lot of people. I'm not surprised. And you know what? I don't think his... Him missing from this has anything to do with the whispers and rumors and allegations. I really don't. You know, some people will say, I, I read, I've already read some comments in the last hour or two on different chat boards saying, no way Denzel Washington deserved a nomination for, for uh, Roman J. Israel Esquire. I disagree. This is one of those situations where you have to separate the performance from the overall movie. Was the overall movie a bit subpar? Yes, it was. However, the performance that we got from Denzel Washington, I thought was phenomenal. Just incredible. I thought he gave a magnificent performance. Yes, the movie he did it in was not that great of a movie. But his performance was great. I totally believe Denzel Washington deserves that spot. If there's anybody I'm a little bit questionable about, it's Daniel Kaluuya. Uh, uh, I, I thought he was very good in Get Out, but... One of the top five performances of the year. I did not think so. I thought he was very good, very solid. Um, but yeah, but then uh, Timothy, obvious. Daniel Day-Lewis, obvious. But let's let's face it, this one is going to be Gary Oldman's uh, award to win. Gary Oldman is going to win Best Actor. Gary, I mean, he should, and he should win it. Uh, I mean, he's just incredible in that. And then we get to the granddaddy one. And that, of course, is Best Picture. And they ended up with nine nominees this year. I was guessing eight, but they came in with nine. And the Best Picture nominees are Call Me By Your Name, Darkest Hour, Dunkirk, Get Out, Lady Bird, Phantom Thread, The Post, The Shape of Water, and Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. I believe this is a two-horse race. I could be totally wrong about that. I believe it's a two-horse race. It's going to come down to Three Billboards and Dunkirk. I think that's who this race comes down between three billboards and Dunkirk. Now, you've got a couple of outside shots here. Certainly, <coughs> Lady Bird and Get Out are outside shots. They've got a lot of heat behind them right now. Um, the Post, because it's The Post, but since they didn't nominate Steven Spielberg for Best Director, I think its chances are slim. So, I'm And, and Shape of Water. Sorry, I meant to throw that in there too. Shape of Water. Three Billboards, and Dunkirk. It is a three-horse race. Sorry, I said two. I forgot about Shape of Water for a second. Um, and honestly, at this point, I don't know which one to call. Dunkirk, Three Billboards, Shape of Water, three magnificent films. Uh, we're just going to have to see how that all kind of shakes itself out. So there are the nominees, guys. Um, 
I think 95% of the nominations they nailed. I really do. I think there are a couple of slightly questionable ones. The Christopher Plummer, the Daniel Kuluya uh, nomination. Um, I mentioned the Christopher Plummer one. Uh, a couple of questionable ones, but nothing that I think are just outright jokes. My, my biggest concern one, though, is, is Batman, the Lego movie, the Lego Batman movie not being nominated. That's probably my biggest one there. But anyway, guys, I'm sure we're going to be talking about these nominations for days. Jump in the comments section and let me know your thoughts. All right. Let me get to a couple of the other topics here really quick that I want to get to some of your live questions. If you've not sent in a live question yet, please do not send in a live question because we're going to run out of time here pretty fast. All right. First question today comes to us from Michael Winter saying, you can't see me. Did you hear that John Cena is going to be playing Duke Nukem? Hands down the funniest games I've ever played. How can you not love a character who writes a book about himself called Why I'm So Great? Is this the movie to finally break the video game curse? And, well, I mean, to be to be specific, and I made a mistake in my headline because I said John Cena is playing Duke Nukem. That was actually a bit of a mistake. Um, what the reality is is John Cena is in talks to play Duke Nukem. Duke Nukem is a movie that should have gotten made 10 years ago. But they're making it now. Okay. Could John Cena do this role well? Yes. I don't think John Cena is yet a strong actor. No. But a character like Duke Nukem... That's just ridiculous comedic timing is kind of a parody in and of itself. I think, I think in the hands of the right director, I think somebody with limited acting scope, scope like John Cena, and he's getting better. Sure. He's getting better. But I think an actor with limited acting scope like John Cena, this type of a character in the hands of the right director, I think could work. And I can think work. All right. And you're right. This better be funny. Now, could this one be the one to break the video game curse? We ask that about every movie. I, I, I'm just giving up giving predictions on that right now. But let's just put it this way. I'm looking forward to a Duke Nukem film. I hope this works out. Whether it ends up being John Cena or somebody else, I really hope they nail this movie because I think it could be really entertaining. All right. The last emailed in question today comes to us from Edgar Cuden, who writes, I thought it was a typo, but it seems Ryan Reynolds is producing and starring in a Clue movie. From ComingSoon.net, uh, Reynolds' company will produce the film based on the Hasbro board game with AllSpark Pictures, which is a, a, um, a, a Hasbro's kind of film division. Which is the film division of Hasbro. Oh, there you go. Which is the film division of Hasbro. In talks to write the script are Rhett Reese and Paul Wernick, who also wrote Deadpool, so you got a team going on here. Are people up for a Clue movie? Um, well, look, I can't speak for everybody. All I know is that then in this house, people are ready for a Clue movie. Anne and Kaori get together at least once a week with our friend Ryan. I don't play, but they get together every week and play Clue. And when they're not playing Clue here in the house, they have the Clue app on mobile and they play Clue against each other there. We have in my living room right now, Harry Potter Clue, Alien vs. Predator Clue, we have Golden Girls Clue, we have classic Clue, uh, and we've got one or two more Clue versions out there. So, uh, Anne is ready. I know Anne is ready for a Clue movie. She's super stoked for it. And the fact that it's coming from Ryan Reynolds. Look, what makes this really interesting to me is that Ryan is also getting his writers from Deadpool to write the script. That could be really funny. The premise of Clue is really opened up to make almost any kind of movie that you want, and it could be really fun, and it could be really special. So, that could be great. All right. Thanks a lot for the question, man. And you know what, guys, before I get to the live questions here, let me do a little shameless plug here. The thing that makes these shows even possible is, of course, my Patreon supporters. Now, do me a favor, guys. Listen, if you're somebody who watches these shows and you spend some time being entertained by them and talking to other film fans here, do me a favor. Take a few minutes out. Go on over to www.patreon.com slash John Campia. Take a look around there. Get a description of everything and learn Number one, what it means to be a Patreon supporter. Number two, how being a Patreon supporter makes these shows even possible. And number three, the benefits of being a Patreon supporter as well. And then maybe after reading all that, you'll want to become one of my Patreon supporters and be one of the people responsible for this channel happening. And that would be awesome. And if not, that's totally okay. I'm just glad you're here being a film fan with us. All right. <coughs> Let's get on to some live questions that you guys have sent in. And the first live question comes to us from... Diggoto1, who writes, 
Are you surprised by how well The Greatest Showman is doing? It only opened with 8 million, and now it's over 100 million domestically and 230 million worldwide. Are musicals back after this and La La Land? I don't think it's an issue of musicals. I think overall it's a it's an issue of good movies. La La Land's a good movie. Um, Greatest Showman, while its narrative part struggled a little bit, the musical numbers are a part of the film and what makes up the overall film, and it just crushed the musical numbers, so that making it a good movie. So I just people think it's a good movie. Am I surprised to make two hundred thirty million dollars worldwide? No, I kind of expected that. But am I surprised after its really slow opening? Yes. After its opening, I wouldn't have thought that it would get to where we all thought it would be originally, but it's really nice to see it have legs and get there. All right. Uh, James Paul Stalmach writes, Hey, John, I hope you're starting to feel better. If it was up to you, uh, who would you give the best supporting actor to out of Woody Harrelson and Sam Rockwell? I think they both did an excellent job. This is a Sophie's Choice, man. I, I, honestly, the two of them, and I'm thrilled to see them both get nominated, I think I would give the slight edge to Woody Harrelson. Sam Rockwell is great in this movie, and I think Sam Rockwell, in general, is a slightly better actor than Woody Harrelson. But we're not talking about overall. We're talking about in this movie, and I actually thought Woody Harrelson, I think he just brought it a little bit more in this movie. Um, so really, if it was right down to me, I would give to them just another reason, though, why if you haven't seen Three Billboards yet, some of the best overall performances of the year from the actors, Francis, who is the lead in the movie. It's just insanely good. Make sure you go and check that out. And these two guys getting nominated for Oscars out of the same film, I think is wonderful and a testament to how good McDonough did directing this film, and yet he doesn't get a Best Director nomination. Three of his actors that he directed get nominated for Oscars. His movie gets nominated for Best Picture, but he doesn't get nominated for Best Director. Go figure. I'm not really sure what to make of that. Okay. My Opinions writes, uh, John, best mate, why no love for Wind River? Hey, you know what? I, I would have thought when I saw Wind River earlier this year, I would have thought, oh, this is going to get some Oscars. But some heavy, heavy, heavyweight quality films came out. And it's just one of those things that proves Wind River is a great example that winning or even getting nominated for an Academy Award is next to impossible thing. It's just there were films out there that were better and performances that were better no matter how good they were in wind river the wind river is just a great case example of how tough it is to win an academy award you can't just be great you got to be great and be greater great than the other films that are great and and wind river just didn't make the cut and it's unfortunate but i still love the film still in my top 10 favorite films of the year uh my opinions again writes also john thoughts on american horror story i don't watch the show so i can't really get i mean i've seen a couple episodes but i, I can't really form a, a base opinion and my opinion also writes, John, wait, one more thing. Smallville, thoughts. I like Smallville. I like Smallville a lot. Um, I'm not going to sit here and give a two-hour dissertation and a season-by-season -season breakdown, but I like Smallville very much. I thought it was a really great show. A, a few weak seasons, I think everybody acknowledges that, but overall, I thought it was a great show. Um, <coughs> Amin writes, can we all agree now that the Academy hates Legos? No, not necessarily. Look, the Lego movie, I loved it. But even I could tell, it's not the type of movie that's going to be for everybody. I still don't understand the first Lego getting snubbed. I, I don't understand that. And I would have given a nomination spot to the Lego Batman movie. I, I don't think there's a general feeling that the Oscars hate Legos. Um, but yeah, I'm surprised. I, I, I got to find out if there's another reason it didn't. Like, I, I got to find out if there was something that disqualified it from consideration or something like that or... Or if they just thought Boss Baby was better than it, which just would boggle my mind. Uh, Masters Young writes, uh, All the Oscar-nominated directors this year also wrote or co-wrote the scripts. New Hollywood trend for writer-director type? I don't know about that, but I think what it tells us is not that the Oscar Oscars lean towards directors who write their own scripts. What I think it, it points us towards is that there is a bit of an advantage when the director was heavily involved in writing the script because they are already so intimately involved with the story and they know it inside out and backwards better than anybody else if they were one of those who wrote it, that then directing it becomes a thing. Look, writing and directing are two totally separate things. They are totally independent from each other. But when you have somebody who has a skill to do both and they write one, then them directing it 
<clears throat> if they are a skilled director, and that's a huge if, then it then they they are, the, the story is already a part of their DNA, and I think that's what we're seeing this year. I don't think it's going to become a trend, but I think it's a very interesting thing you point out. Um, at, Adita just sends in a super chat. Thank you so much, Adita. I appreciate that. Luis Franco uh, Contreras writes, um, Hey, John, uh, what is the status of the shirts? I really want one, uh, uh, but John won. Hope shipments to Mexico will be available. I'm sure they will be. Give me a couple of weeks to really sit down. I'm really busy right now, but I think in a couple of weeks, I'll have a bit of a breather and I'll be able to look at getting some uh, merchandise stuff, some t-shirts, things like that put together. Thank you for asking about them though. I really appreciate that. Johnny Oshuega writes, why no love for Will Poulter? I'm going to put up a video about that. Okay. I'm going to put up, I'm planning on doing a video about Will Poulter. So let me, let me hold off on that. Um, I did it writes, John, Denis Villeneuve over Paul Anderson. Um, boy, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Uh, Yasir the Magician writes, should Vader be in the Kenobi film? P.S. I love you. Thank you so much, man. No, I've said that a million times. I don't want to see Vader in a, in a Kenobi film. To me, it breaks canon. I don't want him there. Um, Aaron Bailey writes, love the live show, man. Oh, thank you so much. Over or under 40%, Tom Holland shows up in Venom. And do you think that's a smart idea given the uh, the deal with Sony. Well, deals are made to be broken, and you can always retract something you do later if you don't want to. I'm going to take the under on 40%, just because that's a big number. 40% is a big number. <coughs> so I don't think it's an insignificant number, but if you're going to set the line at 40, I'm going to take the under on that. Uh, I can't think of a good username rights. How can Boss Baby get a nomination for Best Animated when it has rotten score on Rotten Tomatoes by critics and audience? A a again, that's why this should not even be a category. This should not even be a category. Uh, that's just my opinion. I believe it's ridiculous that it got nominated, especially ridiculous it got nominated over the Batman Lego movie, but hey, it is what it is. Uh, Stig, 100 writes, uh, what's the better Hillary Swank performance? Boys Don't Cry? Or I don't know what MDB is. Why? Also, why is she not in a lot anymore? I'm not really sure why she's not in a lot anymore. She's an exception. She's a multi-time Oscar-winning actress. Um, and her performances in uh, Boys Don't Cry was fantastic. And sorry, guys, you throw out acronyms. I I'm trying to do 15 different things here at once. I may not be able to pull the acronym off the top of my head, so I'm not quite sure what you mean by MDB. Um, uh, Luis Francisco Contreras writes, Love the show. Thoughts on Zac Efron as an actor? Any chance he is getting an Oscar at some point in his career? I think he has a lot of talent. We've heard me talk about Zac Efron a lot. I think he's an uber-talented actor. I think he's really underrated for his pure talent level. Um... He right now ha is working on a film about t the serial killer Ted Bundy, and he's playing Ted Bundy. Don't be shocked if that becomes an Oscar buzz movie and an Oscar buzz performance for Zac Efron. Keep your eyes open for that. Uh, I can't think of a good username, right? Should there be a Razzie-style awards for TV shows? Ah, should there? No. I mean, the Razzies are just for fun. Um, should they do something like that for TV shows? You can if you want, but there's so much TV there's so many movies too. I mean, I don't know. Um, I'm okay with there not being one. I don't think we need one. Uh, Moeen Khan writes, Dundee new trailer, IMDb page. Is this still real? I don't think it's real at all. First of all, <coughs> yes, there's a new little spot out with Chris Hemsworth in it. But again, it feels like a promo spot for something else. And the fact that, yes, they put up an IMDb page after I originally talked about it on my show. But... There's no director. There's no cast. There's no, it, it, it's, I do, I still do not believe this is real. Maybe they'll shock the world and it is a real thing. I'm totally open that that's still possible. I just highly doubt at this point. Uh, Drinks on me writes, <clears throat> I know how you feel about superhero characters being replaced by new actors, but gun to your head, you have to choose one who should never be replaced. Who would it be? For me, it's Wolverine. None. None. Every role can be replaced with a new actor. Everyone. James Bond can. Dumbledore can. Clarice can. Every Han Solo can. Everybody can. Some will be harder to replace than others, but every role can be replaced by another actor. Because every actor who got their role probably got it instead of somebody else who might have even done better. But we'll never know. We'll never know. 
So <coughs> even with the gun in my head, I'm, I would say as my last words, none. That, that, that's, that would be my words. Uh, last couple of quick questions here. Um, Looperox19 says, John, what if Ant-Man jumps in Thanos' ear and turns big? I'd laugh. You, it would be funny, but I'm sure they're going to come up with some kind of mechanism that makes that impossible for Ant-Man to do. But it would be really funny watching his head explode. Um, and Paul uh, O'Donovan writes, hey, John, where do you think the conception that darker tone equals better film first stemmed from? I.e. people says uh, Revenge of the Sith is, a go is good because it's dark. I don't know. Dark, dark light, tone, they're just different ingredients you can put into a cake. One does not make a cake better. Darker does not mean good. Dark does not equal good. It just doesn't. Light does not equal good either. It's having your story and then putting the particular correct tone for that story into it. That's the important thing. All right, guys, I know there's a couple more questions here, but I have run out of time. So I will get to these remaining questions here later today on open mic i'll make sure i answer those questions right off the top of the show for open mic as well thank you for joining me here today guys i really appreciate you being here what do you think about the academy award nominations again there are some obvious flubs but i think again the academy pretty much nailed it they nailed i think about 95 percent of it they got correct and as a subjective thing that's about as big of a number as you can get but there are some very there are a couple as there will be every year a couple of questionable things in there the animated thing for one of them, best actor thing, the best director thing. There's a few question marks, but I think overall they got the most important ones right. And because, look, let's just say it. The Batman Lego movie wasn't going to win best animated film. It had no chance. Coco's going to win that. So it's not like the, the original Lego movie, which could have won best animated picture. This Coco's going to win best original picture. So it doesn't really matter that the Lego movie didn't get nominated, but it deserved a nomination spot. Why didn't? I don't know. Lots of big questions. That will do it for me for today, guys. Once again, don't forget, a little bit later today, it's Star Wars Talk Tuesday. That's at 1 p.m. Los Angeles time, 4 p.m. New York time. And then open mic for its second episode. It is, of course, today at 4 p.m. Los Angeles time. That's 7 p.m. New York time. I hope you'll come back for that. Going to have a lot of fun. Thanks a lot for joining me, guys. My name is John Campia, and until the next video, bye-bye.